Good evening. I'm Kelda Yoon. A community is mourning after a man was killed and his wife and infant child injured by an alleged drunk driver in Bowmanville last night. The family was struck while walking on the sidewalk in a residential area. Durham police also saying today that speed was a factor. Greg Ross has more. <laughs> A home security camera captures the moment a car speeding through a residential neighborhood clipped the back of another vehicle that was attempting to stop at a crosswalk. The speeding car then veers over the curb and hit a family of three. Katie McNeil witnessed it all from her front porch. Next thing you know, this gray car comes flying out of nowhere, hits the SUV, goes flying up over our walkway here and hit three people that were standing to cross the road. McNeil says the moments that followed were chaotic as residents scrambled to help the victims. It was pretty bad. There was people everywhere screaming, help, help, call 911. It was quite a bad situation. Police say a man was rushed to hospital where he later died. An online fundraiser has identified the victim as 31-year-old Spencer McCracken. I can confirm that it was uh, a husband and wife and their child that were out for a walk in the area. McCracken's 30-year-old wife and infant child were also taken to hospital with injuries. They are expected to recover. Police say the driver of the car that hit the family was driving under the influence. At this time, we have one adult male, uh, Mr. Liam Kendall, 22 years of Clarington under arrest for numerous driving related offenses, including but not limited to impaired operation caused death. Representatives from MAD Canada say with everything we know about impaired driving, incidents like this should never happen. How can it still be happening? How can it still be going on? Police say in addition to driving while impaired, Kendall was also driving well over the speed limit, something residents here say is common. People are always flying down this street. It's scary. People in this neighborhood have started a memorial at the location where McCracken and his family were hit. Police are asking anyone who witnessed the crash to come forward. Greg Ross, CBC News. Prominent anti-gun violence advocate Louis March has died. March spent years working tirelessly to eradicate gun violence and to support youth, particularly racialized youth in our city. Lane Harrison has more on how the longtime activist and community leader is being remembered. We already have zero gun violence in the city of Toronto, but it's only in certain neighborhoods for certain people. So if they can have it over there, why can't we have it over here? And where's the political leadership and will to close that gap? Louis March died on Saturday after a brief illness, his family says. He was an advocate in the African-Canadian community and founder of the Zero Gun Violence Movement. Reached by phone, his brother says he was also a family man. Louis is a father and a husband, a brother and a son. We're waiting for results, test results, hoping that Louis would be able to pull through. And unfortunately, it didn't go the way that we all wanted. So. We're still just huddling together, um, trying to get through this. It's a tremendous loss for the family. March frequently appeared in the media, including CBC News, to speak on the city's issues. But he also had an impact in how Toronto approached those issues. The most recent project uh, that I had the pleasure to work with him on was the, re the redesigning community safety uh, focus. Uh, so we had a coalition that had stakeholders from neighborhood associations, uh, to non-for-profit organizations, um, and we actually pushed for uh, the expansion of the Toronto Community Crisis Service uh, to from a pilot project to a permanent service uh, across the city of Toronto. And that was a direct result of the advocacy that Louis brought to our coalition. According to a video on its website, the Zero Gun Violence Movement was founded in 2013 in response to the Danzig Street and Eaton Center shootings. The separate attacks left four people dead and injured several others in 2012. When the name for the movement was first brought up, March's brother Adrian says he was worried Louis was setting a goal he wouldn't be able to reach. But Louis told him, if you want to make change, you have to be bold. Amidst a year-over-year -year increase in gun violence in the city, I spoke to Louis a couple months ago in April, and he was still working hard to reach that goal. We're zero gun violence. We're about zero gun violence, not about a reduction in gun violence, zero. What else can we do to upscale the efforts, 
but also target, deploy the resources where they need to be. NDP MPP Chris Glover commemorated March in a post online. He says his mission can't be forgotten. It's an incredible legacy that he leaves behind, but it's also a call to arms for all of us to, you know, to take up this torch and bring it into gun violence in Toronto. Lane Harrison, CBC News, Toronto. The LCBO strike officially came to an end at midnight Monday, more than two weeks after it began. Workers ratified their new collective agreement over the weekend and returned to their jobs this morning. Ryan Patrick Jones has the details and reaction. Doors at shuttered LCBO stores will reopen to customers tomorrow. Striking workers return today to get the shelves ready. The union says 90% of its 8,000 members who voted approved of the new contract. It was about protecting those revenues that we generate for the province and keeping those revenues in the public hands. The contract includes wage increases across the board, the conversion of a thousand casual workers to permanent part-time status, and better access to benefits. Ontarians we spoke to today say they're relieved the strike is over. Well, it's good. I don't know what percentage of the population drinks it, but uh, I would imagine it's, it's a large amount. I'm glad that the workers are going back to work, definitely. Earlier today, Premier Doug Ford spoke for the first time since the strike ended. We got the deal signed, people are back to work, everyone's going to have a, a, great, uh, a great summer. One of the main issues was the Ontario government's plan to allow ready-to-drink cocktails to be sold alongside beer, wine and cider in grocery, big box and convenience stores. The union worried that losing exclusive rights to sell drinks like hard seltzers would eat into the LCBO's revenue and lead to job losses. The province accelerated those plans last week, putting pressure on the union during the strike. But Ford says ready-to-drink beverages are so popular, there are enough sales to go around. They can't even keep ready-to-drink on the shelves, so we can see that market growing within the LCBO. The union says it did get some wins on the issue, including a promise that no LCBO stores would close over the next three years and a guarantee its workers would continue to handle a certain amount of ready-to-drink inventory. So we needed to ensure that there was still volumes in our facility and bringing back 1.25 million cases into our facilities provides the job security to our logistics and warehousing people. The LCBO says it's focused on returning to normal operations in support of its retail and wholesale customers. Ryan Patrick Jones, CBC News, Toronto. It was another weekend of long lines at the city's ferry terminal. The queue to catch a ferry ride to Toronto Island Park on Saturday stretched out of the terminal and down the block. And Toronto residents say they're growing frustrated. Brittany Bellette has more. This was the lineup Saturday to get onto the island ferries. Long, winding, jam-packed with people. April Engelberg shared the photo on X. Even on a good day, the lines are completely outrageous and unacceptable because it's a public park and we should all be able to access it. The city says that ferries are busiest on beautiful weekend days, as anyone might expect, but it also told CBC Toronto that all four ferries were fully operational during the weekend. That's likely frustrating news for some folks. We need to prepare a little bit better for tourism and, you know, it's a big city and we got a lot of people here. I get it. Um, over the weekend, my grandkids were uh, also lined up and I, I heard that it, it's hard. Toronto's ferry fleet carries more than 1.4 million passengers a year and has a combined capacity of 2,400 people. But the city says the current ferries are beyond the average industry lifespan and earlier this month, council approved the purchase of two new ferries to replace a pair of older ones with a price tag of $92 million. That had been talked about since 2017 and every time it came close to getting the contract out there, it got pulled back. Chow said the replacements could alleviate wait times, but those are expected to be delivered in 2026 and 2027. Engelberg says she wants to see a bigger solution, a pedestrian bridge that connects Cherry Beach to Ward Island Park. So right now, the way we have it, it's like, wait an hour and spend $30 to take your family to the equivalent of Central Park, whereas it should just be free and easy for everybody to access is very much an equity issue. She's not the only one with that opinion. Councillor Parthi Kandavel seconded a motion in June calling for a fixed Eastern link. We've got to do a comparison versus the cost to build a fixed link 
and keeping in mind a fixed link wouldn't require the operating costs that we would have with the current and additional ferries. So a long-term and short-term uh, investment analysis needs to be conducted. So in late June, city councillors passed that motion. That means city staff will be working on a feasibility report, and that's expected to be ready in early 2025. Kelda. Thanks, Brittany. Our Brittany Bullett reporting from the ferry terminal. And those interested in running in the city's next by-election are able to throw their hat into the ring beginning today. Ward 15 Don Valley West has been vacant since longtime councillor Jay Robinson passed away in May. Nama Weingarten has more on some of the names already signing up. Registration for the Don Valley West by-election officially kick-started Monday, meaning those who wish to run can show up right here at City Hall and put their names forward. Some Toronto figures have already announced their intentions to be on that ballot. That includes former Toronto Sun columnist Anthony Fury, who ran for mayor in 2023 and made his priorities clear when showing up at City Hall. Dealing with congestion, uh, tackling rising crime, like the car thefts and unfortunately violent carjackings that are on the rise all across and in that ward as well, and being a voice for responsible budgeting. Architect Sheena Sharp, who's running for the ward a second time, says she wants to focus on building more housing if elected. People say... You know, they don't want their kids living in their basement forever. And they want to, and they want their children to have opportunities and to be able to move out and flourish. The city's not providing that right now. The ward's southern border runs roughly along the Don River, just above the Evergreen Brickworks, which was badly flooded in a storm last week. Evan Sambasivam, a former candidate for Ward 8 who's also running, says he hopes to change how badly floods affect the area. The city needs to do better to keep its necessary infrastructure at the bare minimum, and we haven't been doing a good job of that. You know, other candidates that I've heard have talked about the fact that we didn't have better stormwater infrastructure, but I've also heard some of the same candidates talk about how we need to be slashing infrastructure. Uh, and that's not how the city is supposed to work. Ward 15 hasn't had an official representative since May, when Councillor Jay Robinson passed away after a battle with cancer. She had represented the ward since 2010. Now, those who want to put their names forward to run in this by-election have until the end of September to do so. The actual by-election will be on November 4th, with advanced voting on October 26th and 27th. Nama Weingarten, CBC News. The Paris Olympics are fast approaching and Team Canada has its eyes on the podium. A one team that could come back with some hardware, maybe even gold, the Canadian men's basketball team. 11 of its 12 players have NBA experience and the team captain happens to be a Toronto Raptors superstar. CBC Toronto host Dwight Drummond caught up with Kelly Olenek and fellow NBA veteran Dwight Powell about their upcoming run for gold and how their love of the game started right here in Toronto. What's your favorite thing to do in, in, when you come home, like hometown? Is there something when you get off the plane, you're like, oh, I gotta do this now that I'm back in T.O. or whatever? Um, I mean, usually it's the like, the cliche, like, ice cap from Timmy's from the airport. And... <laughs> it's not cliche, yeah. it's like, one of the fourth Timmy's we've got, right? man, yeah. And a nice, we've got an ice cap too. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> That's so funny. Send the pic to the group chat and then, yeah, okay, yeah. <laughs> man's are home. <laughs> I'd like to start with your connection to basketball because a lot of people know that it comes from your parents. Um, your mom, like, this is an interesting story. Your mom, Arlene Olenek, was the first female scorekeeper mm -hmm. in the history of the NBA. Yeah. That's so cool, man. And, and how did that affect you coming to this game then? Yeah, I mean, I grew up in a basketball family, so you know, my mom was the scorekeeper for the Raptors. And so that kind of just bled into, you know, my love for the game of basketball and the NBA and the Raptors. And then your dad was a longtime coach. People in Toronto would know him at U of T, but he, like for four decades in this country, he's been a high level coach. Yeah, yeah. My dad was a, obviously a player and then a coach, um, coached all over, coached U of T for a long time, coached back in Lethbridge before I was born, yeah. overseas um, with the junior national teams. Uh, yeah, he coached coached everywhere, obviously coached me growing up and my sisters. You know, I still remember, you know, watching the 2000 City Olympics with yes. Nash oh, and everybody, wow, yeah. yeah. You know, late, I was, shoot, in 2000, I must have been like nine years old. Yeah. And I remember we were, is in the summer, and every summer we used to fly, when we lived in, we were, I was born in, in Toronto, yeah. in Scarborough. Um, but so every summer, because like, all my 
parents, family, you know, Kamloops, all our extended right? family lived in like Kamloops, BC, yeah, out, out in the West Coast. I remember I was at my Aunt Janine's house and we were in her living room, you know, laying on the carpet floor, watching these games at like the craziest hours, whenever they were, right? <laughs> now let's talk about the hair, man. Yeah. I keep hearing about the hair. What does Steve Nash have to do with the hair? Yeah, because I mean, your yeah. dad says you, you try to grow the hair a lot because you like the way Steve Nash had his hair. Yeah, I did. I mean, I used to love that, you know, watching him play. It's, it looks good on you. Thank you. you. Appreciate yeah. it. Here's Powell with a slam dunk. How proud of a moment is this for you and your family? And you have represented Canada on the world stage before, but I mean, you're going to the Olympics and have a chance at a medal. How proud of a moment is that for you? No, it's an extremely proud moment. Um, like you said, it's. We've been on the world stage before, and, and it's always something special to wear Canada across my chest. But the uh, the Olympics is you know something very special, so it's uh, something I've been looking forward to, dreaming about since childhood. So um, very excited. What are you most looking forward to at the Olympics? You think the Olympic Village, hanging out with the other world class athletes? What's, what do you think you could have some? What am I most looking forward to? Yeah, yeah. Um, God willing, putting the the gold medal around our neck. That's <laughs> that's what I'm thinking about. That's, that's the right answer right there, Mr. Powell. Um, you're a veteran on, on this team. What kind of role do you think you can play for the, the younger players? Because we, we've been seeing you with that Canada across your chest for a long, long time now. How, what role do you play as a, you and Kelly as some of the older guys on the team now? Um, definitely lead by example. I think we're all, to an extent, going through this for the first time, um, going to the Olympics. So um, we're all going to have to find ways to lead. Uh, I don't think it's just going to be the older guys. Uh, we're gonna all have to pick each other up, and I think that comes to communication, but first and foremost, leading by example and taking care of your business, so um, showing up ready to compete every single day. Run and gun, here's the gun. Olenek! Is this our best team ever, you think? I think this, this could be the best Canadian basketball team ever. I mean, that's the hope, right? Yeah. I mean, the hope is that every team is, that the next team is the best team that's ever, yeah, that's, that's the hope and goal and dream. Now it's my job to make sure these, these younger guys are, are ready to go and you know, pulling rope in the same direction. How proud of a moment is this for you and your family, this opportunity to represent Canada in the Olympics? Yeah, I mean, it's something you know, you've dreamed about since, you're, since I was a little kid, you know, laying on the floor. Um, but you know, my dad had coached you know, with the national teams and you know, always instilled you know, wearing Canada across your chest is some... That pride you know, in the Yeah, movies. that pride and that joy and that... Um, that, that passion that you play with, playing for your country, knowing that you know, there's a way that you can represent your country and give back to the country that helped raise you and give you the opportunities to be where you are. Yeah, remember I said earlier with Powell, he doesn't do things he's not supposed to do. All right, you standout athlete that's, and scholar. We got to mention that at, at Stanford with your science and technology degree. Such a long and successful NBA career, but I mean, for you at this point, it's just topping it all, putting that cherry on the top with that medal. No, that's, that's the goal. There's, you know, there's a lot of great accolades that you can receive, you know, especially in the team level in this sport, and um, an Olympic medal is something very special. So um, to be able to go there and, and compete for that and to be on this journey right now is definitely waking up every morning feeling very grateful. I, I can, I, before I let you go, I have to ask you this, because there's an urban legend or an urban myth about you. And it says that Vlad discovered you on a TTC streetcar. He says that he got on the streetcar and he saw you with your mom and he said, hey, does your kid play basketball? Is that an urban legend or is that story true? I was by myself. He, he stopped me and he's like, hey, I see you every, every other day or whatever, going to the gym, but you don't go to the court, like, where are you going? And I was kind of like, who is this guy kind of situation. And, um, I had told him and he said, okay, like, that's cool and all, but like, you're gonna come play for my team. And I was like, what are you talking about? <laughs> wow. So he, was, he gave me his number and I gave it to my mom. And, and, and the rest is history. The rest is history. I love that story, man, I do. Tall kid on the streetcar, now repping Canada the Olympics. Yeah, yeah. CBC meteorologist Ryan Snodden is filling in for Colette tonight. And Ryan, today just beautiful and tomorrow looking pretty good. Yeah, another nice one shaping up for tomorrow. We will have to watch for the possibility of a few showers and a couple of rumbles of thunder not out of the question. Uh, as we run you through your hour by hour, you can see here a quiet start to the day and we'll get 
uh, warm pretty quickly. And then you can see into the afternoon, this is where we're going to run that risk of a pop up shower. Now the greatest risk is going to be to the north and west of the city from Barrie uh, back towards Kitchener, Waterloo and the London area, uh, but can't rule out an isolated risk even down towards the downtown and also down towards the St. Catharines, Niagara Falls area. There will be a risk of a shower or a thunderstorm there as well and even further to the east. So if you're traveling tomorrow, just be mindful that uh, the greater risks are actually outside of the city, but uh, can't rule out a shower or a rumble of thunder uh, here as well. Now, as we uh, do look at those temperatures, 27, 28, 29 degrees, but it's going to be feeling more like 33 or 34 when you do factor in the humidity. So it will be uh, feeling a little on the muggy side. Now, note as we move into Wednesday, quiet start to the day, but this next weather system starting to approach and that system will edge in as early as midday Wednesday with that risk for showers and thunderstorms. And as the front comes through, that risk will really increase uh, throughout the afternoon into the evening. So it does look like it will be an active day and one to keep your eye on the radar and keep your umbrella handy. Now into Wednesday evening and overnight, that front will move out and in its wake, winds shifting to northwest and a much fresher, drier air mass coming in. So that means the humidity uh, will be dropping off for Thursday. And so if you're not a fan of the humidity, you're waiting for uh, Thursday night into Friday, which will be a much more tolerable sleeping weather. No question about that. Still warm on Thursday, 26 degrees and back into the 26, 27 range again on Friday. And at this point, the weekend is looking pretty good as well. Um, and the humidity not looking too oppressive as well. So really, it's the next couple of days we have to get through the mugginess. And then, uh, yeah, that uh, nicer air mass is certainly on the way towards the later week and into the weekend. That's your forecast to now. Kelda, back to you. Thanks so much, Ryan. And that's our show for you tonight.